In chapter six, we're looking at microbial nutrition and also microbial growth. Microbial growth can refer to the increase in the population of the microorganisms. Why? It's, it's due to the increase of the uh, growth or reproduction of individual microorganisms. Um, now you may be thinking, well, microorganisms by their name, we can't see with the naked eye, so how can we see that they're growing? When you grow uh, bacteria, certainly in a liquid broth, it's going to turn cloudy when bacteria are growing. Fungi it will look different. Fungi tend to keep the uh, broth clear, but they will appear typically as like little balls in there. On solid medium, a discrete colony where you have growing of bacteria, um, what you see is literally millions of cells, but they arose from one bacteria. So when you, when we talk about uh, streaking an auger plate, say on a petri dish, and seeing colonies, discrete individual colonies on there, that's considered a pure colony because it arose from an individual, one single bacteria. Now in 24 hours, like I say, what you're actually seeing as a result of that, you've had the growth, and so by the time you physically see it, there's millions of cells there. A biofilm is when you have a group of microorganisms or this collection. They're living on the surface of something, oftentimes tubes, pipes, things like that. It's a very complex type of community in the way that they are formed and the way they survive, which we'll talk about that as well. Organisms are going to use a variety of nutrients uh, to help them survive. They're going to need uh, certain nutrients to be able to break down to get the energy from them, to carry out their metabolic processes so they can build various molecules that are necessary to build cellular structures. The most common elements that are necessary are carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Now where are the microorganisms going to get their, their nutrients from? It's not like us where we can go to you know, a fast food place and let's have some lunch or something. No, they're going to get it though from a variety of different sources. And of course the way we are, we will break them down, give them different names, uh, we can classify organisms into two different groups based on what their uh, carbon source is. And then we can also, in addition to that, to classify organisms based on what their energy source is. So the groups based upon the carbon source are known as autotrophs versus heterotrophs. And then the based on their energy source are chemotrophs or photos. And this uh, table here just combines all of that together. If for energy source, we look across the top, these columns, if it gets its energy source from light, it's known as a phototroph. If it gets its energy from chemical compounds, it's known as a chemotroph. In terms of its carbon source, if we look at the rows, if it gets its carbon source from carbon dioxide is known as the autotroph. If it gets its carbon source from organic compounds, it's known as a heterotroph. And then you combine these together. So like plants, algae, cyanobacteria, those organisms that are capable of carrying out photosynthesis because they're getting their energy source from the light, they would be a phototroph. Now these organisms are capable of getting uh, their carbon source from carbon dioxide, so they're known as a photoautotroph. There are some of the archaeas, green non-sulfur bacteria and purple non-sulfur bacteria, that cannot use carbon dioxide as their carbon source. They have to use organic compounds, so they would be a photoheterotroph. And then chemoautotrophs, they are getting their energy source from chemicals, but they are using their carbon source. They're able to use carbon dioxide, so they would be chemoautotrophs. And then your chemoheterotrophs, uh, this may be what you're most familiar with. 
They're having to use chemicals for their energy source and orga organic uh, chemicals for their carbon source. Now, in terms of uh, where they get their electrons from, you have organotrophs versus lithotrophs. We have different um, subcategories with all of these two. In terms of oxygen requirements, if oxygen is necessary, absolutely necessary, then it's known as an obligate aerobe. If oxygen can be fatal and deadly, then the organism is known as an obligate anaerobe. Uh, there are some organisms where, yes, the oxygen uh, will actually kill the organism. That requires special working conditions for a lab. So you can look at different forms of oxygen, whether it's uh, singlet oxygen, superoxide radicals, etc. And one test that you can use to see its, how its effect is, is the catalase test, which is what you add um, uh, hydrogen peroxide, and if the enzyme catalase is present, it breaks hydrogen peroxide down to water and oxygen, and so that bubbling that you see is the formation of oxygen. That formation of that oxygen actually for some bacteria can be proved to be deadly, which is why we use it to uh, clean uh, shallow cuts, etc. Um, so Aerobes require oxygen, anaerobes do not, means without oxygen. And then we have various ranges in between that, facultative anaerobes, aerotolerant anaerobes, and micro aerobes. <coughs> Excuse me. You can get an idea sometimes when you grow organisms in a test tube. There's different specialized media you can use, but sometimes just even in general media you can see if there's a lot of fluid in there so it's deep. Look at where in the tube the organism is growing. If it only grows at the top along the surface, then that would give you an idea that's an obligate aerobe. It needs oxygen. The oxygen is not diffusing very well through the media, and so it's going to live only at the top where the oxygen concentration is high. If it only grows at the very, very bottom, it's an obligate anaerobe because the oxygen levels higher up are going to kill it. Facultative anaerobes, it can grow in lower oxygen concentrations, but it doesn't really like it. It prefers oxygen, so you have higher growth at the top, but you do have some of it extending down. If it's uniform, it's aerotolerant anaerobes. It means, you know, I can grow anywhere. If I don't care if there's oxygen or not, I'll grow either place. Nitrogen requirements. Most organisms do have uh, require nitrogen, and if there's insufficient nitrogen, then some of the reactions will stop um, occurring. Now, nitrogen fixation by certain bacteria is essential because not all cells can use nitrogen in all forms. So one Microorganisms play a hero, huge role with nitrogen fixation in terms of con taking the nitrogen in one form, converting it into another form that then maybe plants can use or other organisms can use. Other chemical requirements that you may have to be aware of, certainly in the lab if you're growing, is phosphorus, sulfur, uh, sometimes trace elements, and whether there may be certain growth facts necessary. So this is a table that just gives a list of some of the more common growth factors that microorganisms may need, such as like amino acids so they can uh, make proteins. Uh, maybe they need um, vitamin B2 to help make uh, FAD, which is used as an electron transport carrier. Temperature. Temperature is going to affect the three-dimensional shape of proteins. Uh, and if you have a cha huge drastic change in temperature out of a, the normal optimum growth range for a particular organism, it can affect the structure and structure determines function. So then it can become non-functional or, or denatured. It depends on the particular organism um, as to what that particular temperature 
sure is going to be where things become denatured. Lipids can also be affected by temperature, and remember lipids are a major component of the membranes of the cells. Typically what happens if temperature gets too low, the membranes become very rigid and fragile and can break. If it's too high, <coughs> it becomes too fluid. So you can see what the effects of temperature are on microbial growth. There's usually, like I say, a range, and then you find that optimum where it peaks. Um, this graph will change depending, I mean, organisms that are, say, pathogenic or even non-pathogenic on humans that live uh, in and on us, you would expect their optimum if they're living in us to be around 37 degrees C. Um, I knew someone years ago that was doing research on a bacteria and the uh, optimum temperature for their organism was around 4 degrees C, basically 39 degrees Fahrenheit. It was something that had been isolated from the Arctic Ocean. Well, that makes sense that its temperature optimum is going to be very different. So you look at where the organism is initially found, and that gives you a clue as to where its temperature range may be. Uh, for that particular individual that was working with this uh, bacteria that could only grow in cold temperatures, if it got above uh, 10 degrees C, it would die. Room temperature is around 21 to 23. So he always had to work with it in a refrigerated cold room uh, facility, which was kind of interesting when it's 100 degrees outside and you see someone putting on a heavy jacket and then a lab coat on top of their jacket so they could stay warm while they had to work with it. Um, it, it made for uh, an interesting working environment for them. On this graph at the bottom, or the picture on the bottom, you can see for this particular organism at 22 degrees C, like say around room temperature, there's a little bit of growth, but not a whole lot. There's certainly more growth at 30 degrees C and even more growth at 37. So you, you can see the effect of the temperature. We have different categories um, that we can place macroorganisms in depending on what their temperature range is for growth. Most of what we work with from a medical standpoint are the mesophiles because, as you can see, their optimum growth is right around what the human body is. And certainly the range of growth is where most of us obviously are living. So those are the ones you're going to come in contact with most in the healthcare field. Now, psychophiles are those that can uh, survive under very much colder temperatures, optimum around 10 degrees C. Uh, a refrigerator is usually set around 4 degrees C to give you a point of reference. Thermophiles can survive at higher temperatures, and then hypothermophiles certainly at very extreme temperatures. Remember, water boils at 100 degrees C. So thermophiles will certainly be found in like hot springs, etc. So here's an example of psychophiles growing on a glacier. Um, so what you see in figure A is uh, they kind of have a, a pinkish color to them. Uh, years ago, it was actually interesting showing this picture, and I had a student who became very excited because she originally was from Alaska, and she knew exactly where this picture was taken because she used to be a tour guide to take tourists to go see the glaciers. And on this site, they always wanted to see the pink snow. And so for her, it was the case of she's, I never knew really why it was pink. I just knew it was pink and people paid money to go see it. Uh, so she was fascinated that, oh, this is why it's pink. On B, you can see what the uh, organisms actually might look like microscopic. pH. Organisms will be very sensitive to changes in the pH. Uh, acidophiles will grow best in acidic environments. Alkaline files live in more alkaline, basic environments. Just very generally speaking, it's a very general statement because obviously you have specific circumstances that are going to be different. Bacteria tend to prefer a more neutral to slightly alkaline. Usually, the media that we make, the pH is usually set, sometimes right at 7, but usually about 7.5 to 8. 
Fungi prefer a more acidic environment, usually anywhere from 5.5 to 6.5. So that is something that we can use to our advantage when we make media. Um, it's what we call selective, which we'll get to, into in a moment. You can adjust the pH to help to select for what growth of microorganisms you want. If you want to grow fungi and not worry about bacterial contamination, then lower the pH. If you want to grow bacteria and not have fungal contamination, raise that pH up a little bit. Microorganisms, as all living things, require water. Uh, water is a very important solvent. It's involved with a lot of different reactions. And so most cells are going to die in the absence of water. Uh, so it's going to help with reactions to occur. It also helps to maintain pressure that helps to maintain the shape of the cell, uh, helps with movement of things in and out across the membrane. Uh, a hypotonic solution has a lower solute. Solute is what is dissolved in the solution. Uh, if you place a cell into a hypotonic solution, it tends to uh, take more water in and swell up. If you have a hypertonic solution, you have a greater solute concentration as compared to what's inside the cell. And in this case, the cells tend to shrivel up. Um, so if you have a very high, say, uh, salt concentration, and that increases osmotic pressure, a lot of things cannot survive in that. Halophiles are organisms that can survive with a very high concentration. Water also, you know, is going to produce pressure uh, against the cell. Barophiles are those that can li live under very extreme pressure. There are some barophiles that are capable of living in the uh, deep subsurface down at the bottom of the ocean, at the ocean vents on the bottom. So some of them have adapted to that. There are some organisms that live with a special, unique association, association with other organisms. Um, some of them, it's in a symbiotic relationship where both members benefit. Sometimes it's antagonistic. It just depends on the, the exact um, situation. Biofilms, this is... Uh, something that they used to not really worry about much and the past uh, probably 15 years has become more and more of a problem that they're having to look at. It's a very complex relationship between not just one species but multiple species of microorganisms. They tend to start growing on a surface and then these biofilms will form on the surface. From a medical standpoint, it has become a problem uh, with certain medical devices, especially things that have tubing that may have moisture in them, uh, such as ventilators, catheters, anything like that. Um, the individual organism by itself may not be much of a problem, but you combine them together, it, it, it's kind of like you get one individual, it's not so bad, but you get a whole gang and now you got a problem. So this is a very active area of research as to how to prevent biofilms from even forming in the first place so you don't have the problem. The way biofilms form is that first you have your, your microorganisms. They uh, may attach. Some of them may be killed as they're floating around. But they will attach to the surface. Let's say this is a catheter. They may attach to the tubing. Uh, so they're able to, as they're floating around, they, they attach to the surface. Additional microorganisms may attach to it as well. The cells, as they're growing, they're producing an extracellular matrix. And that's going to be what we call uh, quorum sensing. There's more uh, cells that will come in, and then it triggers the cells to kind of change their biochemistry and their shape. They produce additional matrix, which is kind of acting like a net and a glue, allowing them to stick even better to the surface, but it's also allowing the microorganisms to kind of stick to each other. 
And like I said, it's kind of changing their shape. It's changing their biochemistry. New cells arrive, maybe additional new species, maybe some of the same species. And they're able to stick to this film. And then they also start secreting the matrix. They're on matrix, so that's helping to produce even more film. Uh, sometimes you get even actually like little water channels flowing throughout the film. Uh, to control, it's easier to control one or two bacteria, especially if they're free living. You might be able to add chemical, say, antibiotics that might wash off and affect and kill some of the bacteria that are on the surface. But those that are underneath that matrix, they're protected. It's, it's like you found a big old blanket. You can't get to them. It's much, much harder to treat. And usually, if you're talking, say, a catheter, you've got warm temperature, you've got lots of nutrients always flowing by, and they're like, hey, we can just hang out here, and the food's just coming right straight to us. We don't have to move anywhere. It is much, much harder to treat once that biofilm has been formed. So as I said, that's an active area of research is to try to how to control, ideally how to prevent it from forming in the first place. Uh, but it is a concern in the medical field. If you have a patient that you must either have a catheter or maybe you have to put on a ventilator, uh, anything like that, you want it in for as little time as possible to try to cut down on the risk of the formation of bowel films and then infection to the patient. Inoculum, this is uh, where we're in introducing microorganism into a particular medium. We may be using environmental specimens, clinical specimens, or stored specimens. The when we talk about culturing, we're talking about uh, taking the microorganisms and specifically inoculating them into media to keep them surviving, either for use for research, for testing, etc. When we grow the microorganisms, such as bacteria, in picture B, you can see the individual colonies, as we said earlier. The colonies that indiscre the, the discrete uh, individual mound, if you will. <coughs> the idea is that it, that arose from an individual bacterium. There's millions of what you can physically see, but it did arise from individual uh, bacteria. When you are trying to classify or identify organisms, you need to learn to be very, very observant. And so when you're looking at colonies on a plate, you need to start noticing different things, like its shape. Is it circular? In the picture here on the right, uh, those bacterial colonies are circular. Can you identify solely off the bacteria growing on a petri dish? Usually not. There's a couple species that have very unique uh, characteristics that you could. Bacillus anthracis is one. But for the most part, you could narrow it down, and so that's why you want to be observant. It's to identify bacteria, I often describe it's like doing a puzzle. So each of these observations becomes like a piece of the puzzle that you're going to put together to see what is your overall picture, which is what is your organism. So look at the shape of it, look at the margin. Uh, the margin is what do the edges look like? If it's nice and smooth, it's entire. It might be curled. It might be filiform. Uh, because different species have different characteristics. So you look for that. Look from the side of the Petri dish and see what is the elevation. Is it flat? Is it raised? Is it convex? What does it look like? What is the size of it? Does it look smooth? Does it look rough? Is it shiny? Is it dull? Is it pigmented or not? Uh, a lot of them may look kind of cream, tan color. Some may look yellow. Uh, one we often work with in the lab is red. Is it opaque or is it transparent? So notice all of these things. You might think initially, that oh, doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Look at it. Is it shiny? Is it red like this one? In terms of the clinical specimens and the methods that you're going to use to collect them, it depends obviously on where 
you need to get the specimen as to how you're going to collect them. If you're taking something from the skin, um, the throat, you're going to use a sterile swab. Say you're doing a throat swab, you want to be careful not to touch any of the neighboring tissues because they're going to have microorganisms and you don't want to contaminate it. If you need a blood sample, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you're going to have to do a vena puncture. You're going to have to take a needle and extract the blood from a vein. Uh, cerebral spinal fluid, you're going to have to go to the subarachnoid space of the spinal cord. So stomach sample, intubation. Urine, um, if you need an aseptic collection, you're going to have to use a catheter. Otherwise, you can use what is known as a clean catch method. Uh, basically, we're, you know, have the individual pee in a cup. Uh, so it depends on where you're getting the sample from and how it's going to be collected. In terms of obtaining pure cultures, you, as I said, you want to get cells that arise from a single original bacterium. Aseptic technique is something that you need to learn very early on in the lab of keeping everything sterile around you um, and preventing any form of contamination. Normally in the lab, what that means is you're working around a Bunsen burner within six to eight inches of it. You move further away from that, airflow, etc., can allow for contamination. Always be very careful whenever you open tubes, packages, whatever. You know, once it's open, uh, you have the possibility of introducing contamination. Watch your gloves, what you touch from one thing to another that you don't cross-contaminate things. Now in the lab, there's two common ways for trying to isolate. There's streak plate and pore plates. Now, these are commonly used in the lab to try to isolate organisms. In a streak plate, you're using a petri dish that already has media poured. It's already solidified on there. Usually it's a very rich type of medium uh, that allows for growth of several different things. Uh, for the lab portion of this class, we do cover this. I do have videos of this that you can watch me doing a streak plate and then the results of it afterwards. Usually what you do is you will start by flaming your loop or using a, oftentimes in labs you start where you use disposable loops so they come pre-packaged individually and so you would open the package. And Quadrant number one, area number one, you would streak very heavily with the uh, sample that you had. And then you would, if, say you're using a metal loop, you would flame it. And then for number two, you pick up the inoculum from streak one. For number three, you would go into two. And for number four, you go into three. So you're essentially diluting out. And in picture B, you can see then what happens is the idea is that in quadrant three, and certainly by quadrant four, you should have individual separate colonies. That is the way that you can separate it. If you have a mixed culture that you select there from a pure colony, the ones that you want. The pore plate method, what you do here is you have your initial sample, you inoculate it, usually it's in a tube, <coughs> you may dilute it, in other words, you may pass it from one tube to another to inoculate that. And then eventually what you do, that tube has auger in it, it's liquid. You then pour it into the plate. Because you're diluting it out, each successive dilution, you should have fewer and fewer and fewer colonies. A pore plate is a little bit different than a streak plate. A streak plate, obviously you are streaking on the surface, so you will only have growth on the surface. A pore plate, because you have mixed it within the media and then poured it into the petri dish when it's still warm and you kind of swirl it to fill the dish up. Theoretically, what can happen is you can have colonies not only on the surface, but also embed it within the, the auger itself. And then the inlet set picture on B, you can see certainly there's multiple different types of bacteria. How do I know that? just by looking at it, by the color differences, the size differences. It goes back to look at those characteristics of the individual colonies.
if you were wanting to continue to work with some of these, you would pick a colony, a pure one that has nothing else touching it, and then transfer that to new media for further growth and analysis. There are some other isolation techniques that you can use, such as for fungi, you can use those on a streak of pore plate. Protozoans and algae are usually going to be grown in broth cultures, and you dilute those out. Um, so some organisms, what you can do is you just pick a single cell out of a large group and use that to establish your culture. Excuse me. Um, you may think that we know an awful lot about microbiology. We do, but we don't. Uh, we do know that the majority of prokary or prokaryotic organisms actually have not been able to be grown in pure culture in a lab. We know they're out there. They don't come with a, a manual, and oftentimes I describe them as being like a little two-year-old. They might be picky. And if they don't tell us how to grow them, it can take a lot of time and a lot of patience to figure out if you ever do figure out how to grow them. Some of them are like, I said, little two-year-olds. I only want a chicken nugget from McDonald's because it doesn't taste the same from Wendy's or Burger King or someplace else. It has to be from McDonald's. They they don't tell us this, so it's it can be very difficult. We can do different analysis, know that they're growing in the soil or in the water. We can see the DNA there. We know they're there, but we cannot grow them. Um, you have at your hands um, both liquid and solid medias to choose from. Nutrient broth is a very common liquid medium because it has a little bit of everything in it. So most organisms, the idea should grow in those, even if they're like a finicky, picky two-year-old. Auger is added to media to make it solid. So you can use or add auger and use that to pour the it into petri dishes to make the solid medium there, or also in tubes. Sometimes you have a slant. This is a picture of a slant where you have that solid medium in a test tube. When you make it and sterilize it in its liquid form and then it will solidify, you put it on a rack at an angle so you, you get that angled slant. And later on we will talk about different biochemical tests where you may distinguish a reaction in the bottom of the tube, which is referred to as the butt, versus the reaction on the slant. There are lots of different types of media uh, that are used, things like defined media, complex media, selective versus differential, anaerobic, and then transport media. Defined media is one where you know exactly what the media is composed of. You know that it has glucose. You know it has calcium chloride in it. You know how much it has. So you know exactly what is in it. That would be a defined medium. Complex media, the chemical composition is not known exactly. You, you may know some of the, the chemicals. Uh, and you may know things. There are some medias that we use that has what we call uh, beef extract or yeast extract. What exactly is that? Well, you've grown yeast in something that's broken down and you have additional proteins in there and you know it supports growth, but what exactly is the chemical composition of yeast extract? Well, we don't know. And so that's what a complex media is. It usually, um, complex medias will usually support a wide growth of microorganisms, but I, I can't tell you that has two grams of calcium chloride in it. Selective media is media that, as the name implies, it selects for the growth of some organisms but inhibits growth of other organisms. An example of this is showing uh, in this picture is selective media just by changing the pH. As I mentioned earlier, bacteria prefer, 
prefer more neutral to a slightly alkaline and fungi prefer, pre, prefer if I can talk, more acidic. And so in the picture on the left hand side with the pH 7.3, as you can see, there's a lot of bacteria growing on there, but not fungi. Versus on the right, pH 5.6. Um, you don't see any bacteria on there. That's all different types of fungi that are growing. How can I tell? Well, I, can, I can tell by um, just the look of them, the appearance of them, that it's fungi versus bacteria. But that's, that's a selective media. A differential media is one where you can have different organisms grow but they will appear differently so you can distinguish between them just by visually looking. And just so you know, there are some medias that can be both selective and differential. This is a blood plate where red blood cells have been added to the medium. Um, and we look for the type of hemolysis, the type of breakdown of the red blood cells. It, it looks different. On the far right, the organism that was uh, inoculated there, it was streaked there, did not call any, cause any hemolysis at all. So we call that gamma hemolysis. On the far left, you have a different organism. And you can see it looks different. It looks more green in nature. And that's alpha hemolysis. And in the middle, there's definitely a difference compared to the other two. You have growth, but notice how you have clearing around it. There, it looks yellow because the red blood cells have been lysed. They're, they're no longer there. If you were to put a sheet of paper under there, you could actually read through it. That's beta hemolysis. So just by visually looking, you can tell the difference between these different organisms. That's the purpose of a differential media. <coughs> this is another example using... Uh, a liquid broth, this is for carbohydrate utilization. You're looking to see whether fermentation occurred or not. And in this case, what they did is add a pH indicator. The tube on the left is how it would look initially prior to inoculating it. Uh, neutral pH, it is red. When it becomes acidic or low pH, you have acid production, it turns it yellow. And so once again, just visually looking at it, you can see that acid has been produced. Now in this case you can also see it's kind of interesting. It's a good shot of the tube inside the Durham tube, that inverted tube that has uh, collected, has that gas bubble in it. And so not only was there acid production, but there was also gas production as well. This is showing um, an example of some uh, two different types of differential complex medias. Um, the, it's showing the components, and like because it's complex, yes, you know what some of the, the items are, but you don't know exactly what is the chemical composition of peptone. Not real sure here. Um, <coughs> the uh, pancreatic digest of casein. But it, well, you can say how much of that you have, but you don't know, you know, to write out the chemical uh, structure of it, not so good. What do you use these for? Like McConking auger, that's used to grow gram negative organisms. Um, and then, so number one, it inhibits the growth of gram positives. And then there's going to be a difference in how it looks, whether it's a lactose ferment or, or not. We already saw the blood auger on the previous slides. This is the McConkie here. Um, in, on A, figure A, that is a nutrient auger. Most everything gram-positive, gram-negative can grow on that. Staphylococcus aureus, which is the streak on the bottom, is a gram-positive bacteria. Escherichia coli commonly referred to as E. coli, is a gram-negative, and you can see both of them grew on the nutrient auger. When you look at the McConkie's auger, notice that Staphylococcus aureus did not grow. Why? Because this is a selective media. Gram-positives are inhibited by some of the dyes that are added into the medium, so that only gram-negatives will grow. Well, E. coli is a gram-negative, so it grew. 
Now, notice the coloration of here on the third one. Salmonella is also gram negative, so it also grew, but there is a difference in the pigmentation, that fuchsia color versus the yellow color. The difference has to do with whether or not it's a lactose mentor or not. <coughs> There's different oxygen requirements, so different ways to grow organisms. Uh, if they are aerobic, that's fine. You can grow them in incubator or room temperature under normal conditions. But if it's anaerobic and oxygen is going to kill it, you cannot grow it. Just stick it in incubator or room temperature. You're going to have to grow it using some special um, equipment. Now, some places will have this uh, anaerobic culture system where <coughs> excuse me, you put the petri dish in as you normally would in an incubator. You invert them, put them in, and then you have uh, these packets basically that you, you either rip or you pop, and it will essentially tie up the the oxygen removing it and you have an indicator knowing that in this case it's a methylene blue anaerobic indicator so you can very easily see once you have sealed the container up the oxygen's removed and that yes it is anaerobic. Um, some places we use um, another version of this basically we call them candle jars in our case it's often just a huge pickle jar and you put the petri dish in there and then on the very top or along the side of it you light a candle and then you you close the lid using the premise that uh, for fire to occur it needs oxygen so when that you burn that candle when the oxygen is all removed the candle goes out you store it until you need to 24 or 48 hours whatever you're doing <coughs> and you need to remove it um, not as fancy, not as pretty as this type of a container, but hey, it works. Sometimes you need special media to be able to transport. Um, certainly, say in a healthcare setting, which most of you are trying to go into, you want to be able to take your specimen from your patient and be able to transfer it to a lab. It may need to be transferred from one lab to another. You don't want it to... Um, contaminate anyone else. You don't want the sample to get contaminated with anything off your hands or anybody that's going to be transporting it. You want to be able to protect everyone. Um, you also want to be ideally transfer that um, specimen from obtaining it from the patient to the lab and if it needs to go from one lab to another you want that transport to be usually as soon as possible. There are some special techniques that you may have to use for culturing some microorganisms from animal and cell cultures. Sometimes artificial media is inadequate. An example of this is viruses. Viruses need to be grown in a, a host cell that needs to be living. And so that introduces some uh, additional challenges. And then some need to be grown with low oxygen. For preserving cultures, um, for short periods of time, you just store them in the refrigerator. That will slow the growth down. If you need to store things for long term, then you can deep freeze them. If you're going to store, store things for extremely long time, such as decades, then you can do lyophilization, which basically is a way of quick freeze drying in the sample. It's, it becomes just a powder, and then you rehydrate it when you need to, to use it. Um, lyophilization will prevent water crystals from forming that could potentially rupture the cytoplasmic membrane and cell walls of the, the cells. Binary fission is the way that uh, microorganisms will grow, prokaryotic cells grow. Um, prokaryotic cells do not carry out mitosis, they keep it short, sweet, and simple. So you have your membrane. Uh, the DNA has got to replicate before you have cell reproduction because you're going to go from one cell to two cells. Each new cell needs its own copy of DNA. So you're going to replicate the DNA first. As this is occurring, the cell tends to kind of elongate or stretch out a bit. Once DNA uh, has been 
completed replication, <coughs> then you start to form the septum or this kind of infolding in the middle. It pinches in until the cell wall is complete, and bingo, whoop, you've got two new cells now. And then that process is going to continue on and on and on. How quickly does this uh, life cycle, going from one cell to the point of where it, it replicates and forms two new cells, it depends on the species you were talking about. On average, bacteria can be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. Some bacteria, such as E. coli, that we have studied very extensively, we know everything about it, under optimum conditions. So you, you've got the optimum temperature, optimum pH, optimum nutrients, etc. The generation time or the doubling time, the time it takes to go from one cell to two cell is 18 minutes. Not very long. So generation time is that time that it takes for a bacterial cell to go from having a brand new cell for it to grow and then divide. And that is dependent upon its environmental condition. Species tend to grow, uh, microorganisms grow logarithmically, which means they're going to grow very, very fast. And so uh, usually you have a very sharp increase in growth over time. This is a typical uh, growth curve for microorganisms. There are four distinct phases. There's a lag phase followed by a log or exponential phase, a stationary phase, and then the death or decline phase. In the lag phase is when you have a brand new cell. You may have put it into a new medium. And it's not rapidly dividing right now. It's just growing in size. And then uh, log phase is when it's, those cells are very actively dividing. They're growing very quickly and dividing. Just so you know, later, uh, when you discuss like antibiotics, it's usually during the log phase that the cells are going to be most susceptible to antibiotics. Stationary phase is where now uh, you have basically an equal number of cells that are um, reproducing versus those that are dying. And then in the death phase, you still have cells that are reproducing, but you have more cells that are dying. At this point, you're, you're running out of nutrients at this point if they have not been replenished. To keep a continuous culture growing, this is often done in uh, industrial type settings, you will use what's known as a chemostat. And what that does, it helps to maintain a microorganisms, your, your whole population there, growing uh, in staying in a certain one of those four growth phases, typically trying to keep them in log phase. Um, basically what you're doing, because usually feedback inhibition regulates a lot of the, the various reactions that are occurring, you're wanting, you're, in an industrial setting, you're trying to get the microorganisms to produce a certain product. Now, theoretically, as the concentration of that product increases, to, it will reach a certain point where it's going to turn around and shut everything off. That's what feedback inhibition is. So to prevent that from happening, or to prevent you from running out of the substrates that are necessary to make that product, what an achemostat does is you um, are forcing the more microorganisms to always essentially usually stay in log phase. So you're constantly pulling off the product so the concentration of it never reaches high enough that it's going to shut everything off. And you are continually adding more of the substrate so it can continue to make the, the product. That's how you're forcing it to stay in that certain growth. So this is shown here uh, where you can be adding ad, or air, get whatever gases if it's necessary. You can be adding nutrients uh, to it. But you have a, a release valve where you can withdraw fluid. Is it showing here that overflow tube? So you can be pulling off that product that you want. There's different ways of measuring the microorganisms. Um, you can do microscopic counts. There are certain slides that are made that 
it's they're easier when they have a grid on them to help you keep your place and you literally put on a known volume and then you count and you can always calculate back so many cells per milliliter. Uh, there are electronic counters. There's a couple of different ways where they can measure the amount of light passing through the, the culture or they can measure electrical currents. These are all direct methods. You can do a serial dilution. You can do membrane filtration. You can do what's known as most probable number. A serial dilution, in this case what you're doing is you are taking a milliliter, usually of the culture, you put it into a broth tube and you dilute that out. And then from each one of those tubes you transfer it to a petri dish and you plate it out as well. And then you incubate those plates and you see how many colonies uh, grow. Now in a lab portion, there will be a section on where I will explain to you uh, how to calculate the dilutions, how to calculate the number of cells. For here right now, just know that when you're counting colonies, you will only count within the range of 30 to 300. So if there's more than 300, you record it as T and TC, two numerous to count. If there are less than 30, you do not count them. That would be TFTC, too few to count. So you're doing a dilution because you're hoping to hit somewhere in that window of 30 to 300. Those are the only ones you're going to count to use then to calculate how many bacteria there are per milliliter or per gram of whatever you're looking at. You may be looking at food substance, water substance, whatever. Filtration, membrane filtration is you take your sample, you filter it, you have a, a membrane filter that you filter that usually it's in a liquid form through. Then you place that filter on top of a media and you count. And usually these filters do have a grid on them. Once again, make it easier to count. The membrane filter has a certain pore size that the liquid can go through, but it catches and retains the bacteria on it. This is often done uh, with water samples. Uh, I used to work in a water lab and this is what we did to uh, look for what's known as coliform bacteria, which typically are, are found in the intestines. We were testing water to see if it would be safe for um, human consumption or not. And another way that you can do this, this is not getting an exact count, it's an estimate. It does require a lot of tubes, so it's not used as much anymore. But Traditionally, it's kind of a method, at least to be familiar with it, um, but just for space, a lot of labs don't do it because it, it does require, per sample, it requires 15 test tubes, which can very quickly add up. Uh, you do a dilution once again, and typically you, you set it up so you have uh, three dilutions. For each dilution, you have five tubes. Uh, the tubes do have uh, a pH indicator in them, and that way you can very easily visually see is there a change in the color. Because you're working at different dilutions, you look to see how many of the tubes do you get a positive result in. Well, the number should be different for each set because you have different dilutions. Ideally, the number of positives should decrease as you dilute the sample out. In this case, the first set you had four positives, the middle set you had two, and the last set you had one positive. So you record that number as four, two, one. Then you, what you do is there's a standard table, as you can see here, which is known as the MPN table, uh, it's pro most probable number. <coughs> and what you do is you go through and you find the number that you recorded previously, which was 421. So when you look down the col first column, you find 4, second column, find 2, third column, find 1. So when you find 421, follow across and it tells you the number 26. That is the most probable number of bacteria per 
100 mils. So you're estimating that there are 26 bacteria per 100 milliliters from your sample. Once again, that's not an exact number, but it's an estimate. So at least get you in the ballpark. For indirect methods of measuring microbial growth, there are several different ways. Again, probably the most common is turbidity. That's fineness. Uh, as you can see in figure A, a non-inoculated tube on the left is clear. Bacteria growing in it is cloudy or turbid. So you can use a spectrophotometer, which measures, sends a light wave through it and measures it. So no growth where it's clear, the light would go all the way through. But in the, the turbid one, the one that has growth, the light wave is going to bounce off of some of the, the bacteria. And so you get a, a less amount of light being transmitted through this. And you can measure this, and you can correlate this back to how many bacteria are in there. At some point early on, you would have to do plate samples and figure out, okay, if I get this reading, it's so many bacteria. Once you have that set, then you can just read the absorbance reading. You can use metabolic activity, dry weight, genetic methods, um, Genetic methods are often used. We can isolate DNA. Um, this is used when we've had problems with trying to grow in a lab. We can maybe isolate the DNA from a sample, even though we cannot grow it in the lab. 